Hello everyone, welcome back to Dan Cuts. Today we'll be taking a look at problems 1 and 2 from the Asia Pacific Math Olympiad 2023. The Olympiad was actually held a number of months ago, but the problems were only recently officially released. So without further ado, let us take a look at these really interesting problems. For problem 1, we have a combinatorics problem. Let n greater than or equal to 5 be an integer, and consider n squares with side lengths 1, 2 until n recently, respectively. The squares are arranged in the plane with their sides parallel to the x and y axis. Suppose that no two squares touch, except possibly at their vertices. Show that it is possible to arrange these squares in a way such that every square touches exactly two other squares. So, if you try to think how you might come up with such a construction or configuration, you could put one square down and then say, okay, touch two other squares, I put another square down, then I put another square down based on this uh, condition where it touches vertex, touch and vertex, then I have to go to the next square, so I'll form a chain. And the tricky thing is, you need to put your square so that it forms a chain that closes back to the first square, so, so as to fulfill the condition that every square touches exactly two other squares. Now this is uh, sort of like a difficult problem at first sight, but then you realize that why do you need to make your life so difficult? Well, all you need to do is come up with one construction. So instead of coming up with some fancy construction that goes back and forth like this, why not just put your starting square, go in a straight line, and then figure out if you can bend, bend, and bend, and close back with just exactly the bare minimum number of bends you need. In other words, can you come up with a construction something like this? In this diagram, my x and y axis are rotated at 45 degrees so that the diagram looks nicer. And basically what I was trying to say just now is, can I put down a square, then I go in a straight line, and then I bend around, bend around, and then bend around, and just nice it closes back to touch the first square. In order for the loop to close around nicely, I will need the sum of all these half diagonals and diagonal to equal to the sum of the length of all these half diagonals and diagonal. Same thing, I need the sum of all these half diagonal and diagonal to add up to the sum over here. So then this becomes a problem of arranging or choosing numbers so that things sum up equal to each other and things here sum up equal to each other. It looks like a much simpler problem to solve. Now, I'm going to make a bit of a notational simplification because I don't want to deal with square roots of 2. So, even though the, the squares are of integer length, so let's say this is of side k, then therefore the half diagonal is of length k over square root 2, I'm going to just pretend that everything is scaled by a factor of square root 2. So, when I say this is a square of size k, I'm actually saying that the half diagonal is of length k. So I don't have to deal with any of the 1 over square root 2. Okay, so just bear with that simplification. Now, the other simplification you can do is I can settle two of the sides quite easily. I'm going to just use two squares that sum up to two other squares uh, for the other side. So what is two squares that you can pick here and two squares that you can pick here that will make this work? Well, quite easily, you can pick any four consecutive numbers. But for reasons that will be clear, I'm going to pick the largest four number. I'm going to put n, n minus 3 here. And then for this side, is n minus 1 and n minus 2, so that the half diagonals will all sum up equal to each other. Okay, now why did I pick this, the largest four squares? Well, because all the other squares, I'm going to be putting along the side here. And you need your squares to intersect nowhere except their vertices. So by choosing the largest possible uh, numbers here and putting them at the side, you can be sure that the, the diagonals length here are so small that the squares here will never intersect with the squares here. Okay, you just need to check this, uh, make a mental note to check this. Okay, enough about uh, that checking. Then the question now is, can I choose the squares here and the squares here so that all these half diagonals and diagonal add up equal to this? Let's introduce some notation. So say the sizes of the squares here are a1 to ak, and then below is b1 to bl. 
Then the sum of the half diagonal and diagonal is basically n minus 3, n minus 2, as well as twice of the ai. Same for the bottom is n, n minus 1, and twice of the bi's. So in order for the two to add up to equal, well, the n and n minus 1 is 4 larger than n minus 3 plus n minus 2. So you need sum of ai to be 2 larger than sum of bi. Okay, so it looks like you have come up with a restriction and you just need to arrange your numbers so that this equation here holds. But actually, once you start trying it, you realize that you will face some difficulty. Uh, but the good thing is, you actually can have one more option. What you can do is, you realize that I need not put n minus 2 and n minus 1 in this order here. I can actually also swap these two around and put n minus 1 on top and n minus 2 below. And if I do this, then the sum of n and n minus 2 is now only 2 larger than n minus 3 plus n minus 1. So the other way I can come up with a construction is to choose the a's such that the sum of a is 1 larger than the sum of b's. So depending on whether I can come up with plus 1 or plus 2, I can put my two squares here accordingly. So I have simplified the problem into the following. Can we split 1, 2, until n minus 4 into two sets a and b, such that the sum of the a's is 1 or 2 larger than the sum of b's? So when you're faced with a problem like this, again, the common thing to try is to construct for small cases and hope that you get some intuition or pattern. So when you have just n equals 5, in other words, you have the number 1 only, well, it's quite easy to make a 1 larger than b. Similarly, if you have 1 and 2, you just do this. You have 1, 2, and 3, you have this construction. You have 1, 2, 3, 4, you have this construction. And then now you realize that, okay, that isn't really any very clear pattern. There's another simple way you can generate the construction for way larger cases. Notice that once I create the gap, maybe all I have to do is slot in all the other remaining numbers so that I don't disrupt this gap. I remain retain the gap of 2 or 1 accordingly. And the way you can do this is as follows. So we have all the numbers here. Imagine breaking all the numbers up from the right uh, in blocks of 4. So if we have a block of 4, we can put these two numbers in A and these two numbers in B. And the sum of A and B will not uh, change relative to each other. Because this sum is equal to this sum. Same thing, the next block of 4, I put these two in A and put these two in B. The difference between them will not change relative to each other. If you keep repeating this pattern, eventually you will reach a state where you have 1, 2, 3, or 4 numbers remaining. And then that is where you throw in either of this construction accordingly, and you generate your gap of 1 or 2. So that is all there is to this problem. I hope you agree that this is actually quite a unique combinatorial problem. Not really something that I have seen before. So hope you enjoyed that problem as well. Okay, right now let us move on to problem 2, which is actually another fairly unique number theory problem. For this problem, we need to find all integers n satisfying n greater than or equal to 2, and this equation holds. So sigma n here is the sum of all positive divisors of n, and then pn here is the largest prime divisor of n. So let me just rewrite this a bit. You need the following equation to hold. Sigma n equals to this multiple of n. Okay, when you're faced with a problem, again, the usual technique is try simple cases. So in this case, maybe you want to see, can I have n equals to a prime power? Well, let's just submit in. So sigma n, in this case, sum of prime power is this. Uh, sum of factors for prime power is this. Then the largest prime divisor is obviously p, so it's p minus 1 here, and then n is p to the k. And by looking at this, you will very quickly realize that, well, p divides the right-hand side, but p does not divide the left-hand side. So there's no solution. Wow, it looks like a really good start. Now, actually, if you think about, can I generalize this idea to general n, maybe you will consider something like divisibility, can I like work out the prime factors of n and then use some GCD condition and so that there's no solution and so on. 
unfortunately, you will get caught up in a rabbit hole. For me, I can't find a solution that make that work. So eventually, I figure out that, okay, I must look at this from another perspective. So what's another possible idea you can try? Well, firstly, you notice that this is a very nice condition when the sum of dividers is an exact multiple of n. Do we know of a situation where this occurs? Well, obviously, well, sigma n will not be equal to n. It's strictly bigger than n because you have 1 and n itself. But I can actually have sigma n equals to twice of n because there are such things called perfect numbers, right? So perfect numbers are numbers where n equals to the sum of its uh, proper dividers. So dividers other than n itself. And for those numbers, sigma n is exactly equal to 2n. And then if you think about it, actually those are not, say, very common. Can you actually get even larger than that? Can you get like more than 2n? Well, unfortunately, it turns out that you can also get sigma n equals to 3n. You can get even bigger than 3n and so on. But in order to get like sigma n equals to 3n or, or some large multiple of n, you will realize that actually you need your prime factors to stack up and you have a lot of prime factors. And then you start to wonder, actually, if you have large numbers, pn is also going to be very large. Can, can I really get sigma n to be so many times larger than n? Yes, you can, but can I get it to be pn minus 1 that number of times of n? Remember, as your number gets bigger, your pn is going to get bigger, or tend to get bigger as well. So you're going to be like chasing after a shifting goalpost. So that gives you some inspiration to consider, okay, maybe I should find a bound on sigma n over n. If I can show that this is smaller than the largest prime factor minus 1, then I will have concluded that there's no solution, right? Actually, there, there are solutions, but they are going to hopefully limit your scope of search. So let's try and work out a bound for sigma n over n. So if you have n equals to the standard prime factorization form, where p1 is smaller than p2, dot 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 smaller than pr, then sigma n is basically given by this usual expression here, okay? Then sigma n over n, that's where you realize that perhaps things are going on the right track. Because if you divide by n, what you do is your p1 over a1, uh, p1 to the power a1, you can put it into this bracket, you'll get this geometric series here. And then the p2 over a2, you put it into this bracket, you get this geometric series here. And so on. Which means you can actually bound this by the following infinite geometric series times infinite geometric series and so on. Now, this is equal. So this is also an equal sign. Apologies for that. This is equal to the following closed sum formula. Following closed form formula and following closed form formula. So what we have established so far is the ratio is bounded by these various uh, products. And you just need to write one more step of simplification and you will think that actually you are on the right track. Because these fractions are all just slightly bigger than 1. And in fact, the more you go, the closer and closer it gets to 1. So you multiply things that are just slightly above 1, you are going to get hopefully a small number. And that is hopefully going to be strictly smaller than pn minus 1. So indeed, in the worst case scenario, you can bound this by 2 over 1, 3 over 2, 4 over 3, and so on, until r plus 1 over r, which is a telescoping product that gives you r plus 1. So this ratio is bounded by r plus 1, but you need this ratio to be the p, the largest prime minus 1. You have r prime factors, and this is the R smallest one. Well, there's not much hope going on. So indeed, if you have three prime factors, let's say, starting with this case, R plus one is four. But the smallest that the third prime factor can be is five. So you already have a contradiction. There's no solution because the ratio here is less than four, but you need the ratio to be five, at least five. And it gets even worse if you have 
even more prime factors. R plus 1 is only going to increase in steps of 1, whereas your largest prime is going to jump by at least 2 each time you increase, uh, you hit R up a notch. So there's going to be no solution at all for R greater than equal to 3. Well, we have considered a case R equals to 1, so it remains to think, how about R equals 2? Well, if you have only two prime factors, okay, R plus 1 is 3, and this ratio you need to be equal to uh, P2 minus 1, right? The, the second prime minus 1. So you need this to be less than 3. The only possibility is your second prime is 3, so the first prime is 2. So this means that your only remaining candidates for N are of this form, where you have at least a factor of 2 and a factor of 3, and that's all the prime factors you have. Now, once you reach this stage, it's quite easy to just uh, brute force your way through to find all the possible values of n. I'll show you one possible way, which is to just sub in the formula. This is for the sum sigma n. This is your largest prime minus 1, and this is n. So if you write out the formula for the geometric series, you get this. You move the factor of 2 over and combine, you get 2 to the a plus 2 here. And since this is not divisible by 3, and this is not divisible by 2, it must be the case that this power of 2 matches here, and this power of 3 matches here. So in other words, you have this equality here. And because a is at least 1, this thing is at least 3, so this power of 3 here is a multiple of 3, which means if you consider mod 3, you need a plus 1 to be even. So I can use a, the square minus square formula and factorize as follows. And now I have two different powers of 3 that differ only by 2. So what powers of 3 differ by the difference of 2? Well, the pos only possibility is this is equal to 1 and this is equal to 3. And from there, you have solved it fully. The only possible cases is this is 3 times 1 equals 3. And therefore, n is equal to 6. So that is all there is to problem 2, and I hope you also found this to be a really interesting and unique problem. So I hope you have enjoyed the problems I've covered in this video. If you like more videos like this, do subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for the next video. See you soon.